Amen, amen, amen. Uh, my name is Josh Trueblood, and I am one of the pastors here at Grace, and uh, it's a really special day. Um, one, of the, one of the blessings of being a pastor is that sometimes I get to study God's Word on a particular topic, and I get to see brand new treasure that I've never seen before. And it absolutely blows me away. And when the band is up here and we're singing about our Lord and we're worshiping Him, sometimes I'm in a whole different place. And I got to tell you, this particular week on Mother's Day, I'm in a whole different place because I believe God has the solution for every problem. I believe He has healing for every wound. Um, He's just here for us today. So we're going to dive into this Mother's Day message. Um, I already said happy, happy Mother's Day to all of our moms. Um, as we go into today, let me ask you the question this way. As we go into today, how many of you have complicated feelings about your mom? Don't raise your hand, please. She's sitting next to you. Don't raise your hand. <laughs> Some of us do, though. Some of us, when we think of the cookout that we're about to go to or, or we think of the car that we need to buy still, we think about the words that maybe we should say, complicated feelings come up. And so we're going to talk about that, 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 that statement, it's complicated. And I've, I've got a, a little um, scale for you here up on the screens, the perfect mom to the it's complicated mom scale. Now, down at the perfect mom scale, maybe, maybe yours was like uh, June Cleaver, you know, or um, Carol Brady or Claire Huxtables. It's just the perfect mom. Or maybe you're down at the other end with like a Marge Simpson, maybe. <laughs> and when you go to the, to the card aisle, the, the Hallmark aisle, and you're looking at cards and you're like, I'm not sure this authentically describes my feelings and I'm struggling to find a card that describes my feelings. And maybe it would be nicer if we went to the Hallmark aisle and it was organized like this. <laughs> Did we get too honest just then? Because we're all people, and we're all broken, even our moms. And sometimes the feelings get a little bit complicated, and sometimes we don't quite know what to do, and, and, and some of us get a little bit tied up in it all. And so today isn't about being depressed about it. Today is about finding the treasure that God has along his path of healing, amen? Because he's got treasure for you. Let's go to Matthew 15, 1 through 6. And when we jump into Matthew 15, 1 through 6, this is going to be some juicy Bible right here, okay? Uh, we're going we're gonna to do some good Bible study here. And it, it might feel like it's going one direction at first, but just wait for it because it's going to surprise you. Verse 1, some Pharisees and teachers of religious law now arrived from Jerusalem to see Jesus. So this is a delegation. They've come up to investigate Jesus Christ. And if you've read the Gospels, you might know that this happened quite a bit because Jesus during his ministry was making quite a stir. He was teaching a lot of things. There were a lot of miracles going on and there were people who opposed him. They weren't sure about Jesus. So they're coming up to see him and they asked him, why do your disciples disobey our age-old tradition? For they ignore our tradition of ceremonial hand washing before they eat. Now, again, on the surface, that might seem like why are they asking that question? Because shouldn't we wash our hands before we eat? Where are the moms at? <laughs> yes? Of course we should. But this was going beyond. It wasn't just getting your hands clean from a hygiene perspective. They had all these specific ceremonies on how the washings should be done that were handed down by the priests, by the scribes. And they had added to what God's word had said in the Old Testament. And so Jesus is about to come after them and, and talk to them about the difference between the tradition and the Bible. Do you know there's a difference between church tradition and what it says in the scripture? And this is something, if you're new to Christianity, this is going to pop up a lot, especially as you read about the ministry of Jesus. He's almost always coming after what the religious people had done to God's word. And then they added all these burdens onto it. And he said, the burdens are wrong. And sometimes your tradition even goes against God's word. Like, let me give you some examples. Did you know that 
it is not in the Bible that priests have to stay unmarried. That's not in your Bible. Praying to Mary is not in your Bible. Some of you were raised in the church to believe that you could not drink alcohol. That's not in your Bible. Uh, the fact that all Christians should be Republicans is not in your Bible. Depending on what church you grew up in, the fact that all Christians should be Democrats is also not in your Bible. There's a lot of things that, it's one of the reasons we say as pastors to you, read your Bible. Because if you read your Bible, especially as an adult, you're going to be shocked over and over and over again at what well-meaning people have added to what God actually said. And some of that stuff just does not hold water. So Jesus was all about, Jesus replied, verse 3, And why do you, by your traditions, violate the direct commandments of God? For instance, God says, Honor your father and mother, and anyone who speaks disrespectfully of father and mother must be put to death. But you say it is all right for people to say to their parents, Sorry, I can't help you, for I vowed to give to God what I would have given to you. If we could keep that slide up for just a minute. You're like, what in the world's going on here? Well, this is an idea, and, and, and you see this also in Mark chapter 7, talks about this story. Mark inserts this word korban. Korban was this idea that people could, grown sons, could look at all of their wealth, all their possessions, all their land, and they could vow that it was korban. And what that meant is that it now belonged to God for the rest of their life. It was dedicated to him and for his service. But there was, a, there was a loophole in it. The loophole said, you can dedicate all your stuff to God as a young man, but you don't actually have to give it to God until you determine it's the right time or the right way. Right? You're like, well, that's a fancy little religious thing to do, isn't it? Like, I could wait to my deathbed and then finally give it to him. And then there was a real zinger in this tradition you could call it all Corban. And then if mom and dad ever came along and said, hey, we need help, son, with our medical bills, you could say, sorry, mom and dad, can't help you out because it's all dedicated to God. So Jesus is saying, listen, that might have seemed like a good idea when that tradition first started out. And notice he's talking to grown men and women here about their adult parents might have seemed like a good idea, but somehow you got all twisted up and now you're not even obeying one of the Ten Commandments to honor your mother and father. Verse 6, in this way, you say they don't need to honor their parents and so you cancel the word of God for the sake of your own tradition. Wow, Jesus, you say we cancel God's word? It's a big statement. So here's the interesting thing. 2,000 years ago, grown children were looking for a loophole so they didn't have to honor mother and father. Interesting. And we're so different now, aren't we? I wonder if you talked to any of them at that time. I wonder if they would have told you, yeah, but with my mom, it's complicated. Maybe. 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 But see, Jesus has a treasure for us. Jesus has a treasure for us that's not going to be an easy treasure. It's going to be an obedient treasure where we trust him even though it's complicated. And we follow him and we obey him. And we start stepping forward along the path even though it's complicated. And that as we trust him and we follow him along that path, we're going to find healing coming in. Amen? Do you trust him this morning? So how, how does honor work? Honor is a really interesting Bible word, and so we're going to get underneath the word honor here for a second. Here's some Bible verses for you that kind of explain this. Ephesians 6.1, if you're a kid, that means you obey mom. So if you're a child in the home, you're at that stage of life, it's about obeying her. That's honor. Next, the rest of them are if you're not a kid. If you're not a kid, 1 Timothy 5.4, it means care for her needs. This is massive. 
It says, if a widow has children or grandchildren, these should learn, first of all, to put their religion into practice. How? By caring for their own family. And so repaying their parents and grandparents for this is pleasing to God. That ought to really challenge us. Look at what it's saying there. Paul is coming in and he's saying, listen, in a sense, it's like your parents and grandparents invested into your life. And when you get to care for them in their old age, you're repaying. Isn't that a beautiful idea? That's in your Bibles. And these are, these are the kinds of verses that we forget sometimes. But means care for their needs. Next, Add to her happiness. This is Proverbs 23, 25. So give your father and mother joy. May she who gave you birth be happy. Now what this doesn't mean, it doesn't mean you're personally responsible for your mother's happiness. Can I get an amen on that? Right? When we, when we, right, right? <laughs> when we tether ourselves, when we tether ourselves to the happiness of someone else, that's codependency, that's people-pleasing, that's a dark road to go down. You can't take responsibility, ownership for their feelings, but you can add to her happiness. What makes her happy? Right? What are the things that you've done in the past and you've gotten a reaction, a happy reaction, right? <laughs> the happy reaction is what I meant to say. Can you do those things? Next, Proverbs 23, 22. Listen to her advice. Listen to your father who gave you life and do not despise your mother when, when she is old. You're, you're listening. You're, this verse is written to an adult and they're listening to their parent. It doesn't mean they're obeying the parent. It doesn't mean they're agreeing or going along with their advice. You know one of the needs your mom has today? She wants to feel relevant in your life. She, wanna, she wants to feel like she's got a role in your life. And it doesn't cost you a lot. It costs you something. It doesn't cost you a lot to listen to her, to invite her in to the different things that you're wrestling with and let her give advice. She might just be right every once in a while. Next, walk in respect toward her. Leviticus 19.3, each of you must respect your mother and father and must observe my Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. So that's just some ideas. And some of you are in a spot where you're like, I could, I could do multiple of those things today. And that's great. Some of us, we're all tied up in knots on that list. We can be honest about that. Some of those things feel like they're they're out of bounds for you right now. The way, just the way that your relationship is, maybe pick one. Which one of those could you do? When I was 11 years old, I got a chance to honor my mom. I was 11 years old, and <clears throat> she was very involved in our church growing up. And she liked to decorate, just like summer jam and Christmas and all this kind of stuff, you know. And you should never do this, but she was standing up on a table hanging decorations right? Bad idea. But she did it, and she fell. And when she fell off the table, it shattered her ankle. It was a massive surgery, and there were plates and screws and all that kind of fun stuff involved. So she's a single mom. My dad left when I was two. And so there's three of us at home, all in that, I think my sister was 13, I was 11, my younger sister was probably 10, 9, and so us three kids are kind of taking care of mom while she gets better. And I got a chance to honor my mom and help take care of her. Most of us kids don't get that chance when we're young. And there was one particular day, and she wanted a sandwich. And some of you know I have a special relationship to mayonnaise. Um, I don't remember what meat she wanted on that sandwich or what cheese she wanted. I think there were other things on the sandwich. But I had to, out of love for her, take a jar of mayonnaise, put a knife in it, demon jelly, if you will. I don't think I knew how much I hated it until that moment. 
had to smell it, had to see it, the texture, the whole package. I almost lost it. One of the most horrible experiences of my life. But I honored her by making this sandwich. And personally, I think I should have gotten credit for about three full Mother's Days just for that moment. Maybe five. Only Jesus knows. I haven't made a mayonnaise sandwich since. <sighs> How do you honor your mom? How do you honor your mom? How do you walk forward in this challenge that Jesus has given us? And some of us aren't ready to do that. Some of us aren't ready to take some of these steps yet. And let me just dive into why. Let me step, step into the reasons why some of us are stuck. The very first reason I think that we sometimes don't honor our parents. And by the way, you might be great with your mom today. It might be your dad that you're going to be struggling with at Father's Day. Feel free to take this in for that. Maybe you don't honor because you would say to me that it's really complicated. Like, yeah, there's complicated, but I've experienced really complicated, and you don't understand, Pastor, the things that she didn't do and the things that she did do. So let's just talk about them. Can we talk about them for a minute? And this is not meant to be a downer, by the way. This is meant to be honest because we're a broken church family. Can I get an amen? We're a broken church family. We don't stop people at the door because they're not all cleaned up yet. And we don't stop people at the door because their families aren't all cleaned up yet. We come as broken people. So let's talk about it honestly so that we can really feel the weight of what Jesus has told us. Because some of you will make choices today that are way more courageous than even I could imagine. I don't know all the things that she didn't do for you. Maybe she didn't protect you and she allowed others in the home to hurt you. Maybe she was not emotionally available to you. She was not physically present for you. She didn't teach you. She didn't encourage you. She couldn't pay for things because she had blown all the money at the casino. How about that? Maybe she wasn't emotionally present or physically present because she was looking for her next boyfriend or she was trying to find her next promotion. How about the things that she did to you? Maybe she put on you unreasonable expectations, various kinds of perfectionism, and she asked you to carry that weight. Maybe her parents had asked her to carry that weight, amen? Maybe she was controlling. Maybe she was manipulative. Some of us, this, this stuff that I'm describing is in the past. Some of it, it's in the present, even harder. She taught all the wrong things. She was all tied up in knots, so tied up in knots herself that she was struggling with a level of depression constantly in the home. She was isolated. She was just absent. She just wasn't there. She was there, but she wasn't there, and you know exactly what that means. And you've been through that. Maybe your mom struggled with alcohol or various other addictions, and Maybe anger was something, and anger overflowed, and it impacted the family, and it impacted you directly. Maybe it even got to the place of abuse, and maybe it was verbal, maybe it was emotional, maybe it was even physical. Are we really being for real now? Because some of us came, and the things, the words of Jesus today for us, if we're in that kind of a place, it's a whole different level of courage, amen? Amen. God help us. God help us. So let's turn the corner for a minute. See if I can cheer you up a little bit. When I go to Chick-fil-A, the Lord's chicken, amen? It's so good. And I should eat the grilled and I don't. I should. But I go to Chick-fil-A and I go to the person at the counter and I don't get the value meal. And this bothers them. And it's always an argument. They don't understand why I don't want the value meal. Can anybody relate to this? And I like the waffle fries. The waffle fries are great. They're awesome. Amen. But as a 47-year-old man with my metabolism, 
I only get so many calories to spend. Okay, and I'm not spending it on waffle fries. I just like the chicken better. And I've got to explain it to this young person each time. They're just numbers up there, sir. Just pick a number. I don't want the number. <laughs> I'm an a la carte guy. Talk to anybody that knows me. Ever been to a restaurant? I am the high maintenance order person every time. <laughs> Customize it. Why not? Customize it. Here's the deal. Some of us, we come to Mother's Day, and because it's complicated, we're like, I can't do the whole big thing. And because you can't do the full package deal, you don't do anything. Right? Don't we get stuck there sometimes? Or sometimes she asks for this big thing, and you can't do the big thing she asks for, and so you do nothing. Nah, customize it. Go a la carte on that thing. It's Mother's Day, right? Like, if you can't stay all day, go anyway, spend 30 minutes. Right? Like, if you can't go, then call. And if you can't call, write a letter. She might cherish that more anyway. The question isn't, What's the package? Be done with that. Just customize it. Just you do what you can do. And don't get stuck. Amen? Amen. 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 Next, sometimes we got our boundaries way too high. Ooh, this is hard. I'm probably going to get myself in trouble. I'm going to try not to. So last November, some of you guys were here at this church last November. We, we did a series called um, uh, You Asked For It. And one of you guys asked for a discussion about boundaries and could Christians have boundaries specifically with family. And I did a whole teaching on that. And I got to just tell you, sometimes there's a limitation with this format we call the sermon. I only get so much time to cover so much material. And sometimes I can't cover it all. And if you know me well, you know I always take more time than they've given me. Always. It's like a rule. But I can't do the fully exhaustive Bible study class sometimes that I wish I could. So back in November, why am I saying all that to you? Because back in November, I did this discussion on boundaries. And I was talking mostly to people who were stuck in a place of Christian people-pleasing. And you didn't realize that sometimes you could bring in a boundary and get your relationship to a healthier place. Right, like all boundaries are is like, like, you know, this is my space and that is your space and this is how I get respected and that's how you get respected. That's what a boundary is. But not all boundaries are created equal. So see, sometimes in our relationships, we can go too far, we can go too little. Just like we got people pleasers on one side, we can have people over here where you're building such high brick walls that you're gonna isolate yourself and you're not going to have family. Be careful. Be careful. Different boundaries are needed based on maybe some destructive behavior that was in the past versus what's in the present. I think most of our boundaries should not feel like or look like brick walls that cut a person off from us. They should look like a gate in the fence maybe. That sometimes we open up and sometimes we need it to close because we can't do anymore. But we've got to work through that. And the truth is, every single one of your situations is a little bit different. And I know that when I'm talking about this situation with you and with mom, sometimes it's, it's that behavior. You've had to make boundaries. So I'm not saying you shouldn't have. I'm just saying, let the Holy Spirit come in and shape that for you. And maybe part of the shaping that he wants to do is maybe your boundaries this year look a little more hopeful than your boundaries last year did. Talk to your life group leader. Talk to your pastor. Talk to your counselor. Work through those things in detail. As we walk along this road, got to do the work. We've all got to do the work. It's different for each of us. Amen? 
All right, here's the real treasure. This is one of my favorite passages in Scripture. The God of all comfort. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3. I'll read this to you. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The, God, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort. Say God of all comfort. God of all comfort. He's the God of all comfort. Some of you guys know the, the verse out of the Old Testament that says, His mercies are new every morning. We actually just sang that. His mercies are new every morning. God's got new mercies for you all the time into your life. He's the God of all comfort. He's brought comfort specifically into your situation. He comforts us in all our troubles. And then watch the way he stair steps through this. So that we can comfort those in any trouble. How? With the comfort we ourselves receive from God. Oh, just chew on that. Any one of you that is in any kind of ministry, from our kids to life group leading to eldering to anything, this is the basis for your ministry. All you're trying to do is to take the comfort that God has poured into your life, and you're trying to pour that same comfort out onto other people. And you might look at that at first, and don't do this, but you might look at that at first and say, well, this is just paying it forward. No, it's so much more. See, paying it forward is just this idea of you've got this responsibility to pass the blessing along. And that's true according to this verse. But it's way more. Because when God comes and God comforts us in our troubles, he empowers us to pass that comfort along. Do you realize it was part training for you? See, if, if you lost a parent when you were young, and you meet someone else who lost their parent when they were young, guess who has the most to say to them? Not me, you do. Because you walked through it. And they know in that moment that that qualifies you to be able to speak. It gives you authority. Because you received unique blessings from the Lord when you walked through that, as hard as it was. But God was there for you, and you learned things you learned wonderful things. That's the basis of ministry. So now let's bring it into Mother's Day. Because what that says, so that we can comfort. What that means is, you're all comforters today. Say, I'm a comforter. I'm a comforter. Like, I've been deputized. Do you know that? God came and he comforted you to deputize you to comfort other people, along with the things that he gave you. So what's number one in that list, right? Forgiveness. Remember what Jesus said on the cross? Father, forgive them. What have you been forgiven of? Right? What does your mom need to be forgiven of? Could you be her comforter today? Could you give her only the things that you've been given? And you're like, that's a big, that's a big thing to say. You don't know. I know I don't know. Just take a step. What's the step you could take in forgiveness? In God's time, as you're able, yes. Yes. But don't let it's complicated be an excuse for never moving. Because sometimes our authenticity and our honesty about the darkness of our situation can turn into an excuse to never move. And Jesus has got more for you. I'm not up here trying to beat on you. I'm just saying Jesus has got blessings for you. And it's not just for you. It's for your children. And it's for your grandchildren. What does he want to build into your family? And notice Jesus didn't just say, Father, forgive them. He says, because they know not what they do. What's in that? The Savior's giving you understanding. He's saying, every, every screw up in your life, you didn't realize the destruction that was on the other side of your choice. <laughs> and he said, I love them, partly because they didn't know. Is it possible she didn't know? Could you give her that understanding? 
It's while we were yet sinners that Christ died for us. See, Jesus died for you, and you weren't religious yet. Jesus died for you. You hadn't reached out to him yet, but he still died for you. Some of us are in a place where we're waiting. We're waiting for her to get better so that we can love her. God's got more. I'm going to read you a little letter I wrote to my mom, Terry Trueblood. I don't know if she's online today or not. Happy Mother's Day if you are. (laughs) There's this letter I started writing to her years ago, and I just keep pulling it out every year and shaping it and refining it and adding more stuff to it. Say, Mom, I'm so grateful for you and all that you've done for me. When my dad left our home and left you to raise three little kids on your own, you did not let despair and heartache take over your life. You kept moving and you stayed strong. I didn't have any idea at the time what faith and strength and iron will that took for you, but she did it. Thank you for running a daycare out of our house, Mom. I won't lie, I did not enjoy the screaming babies in the house or the smell of dirty diapers or the parents who showed up late to pick up their kids while my dinner was getting cold. But I know that you did it so that you could stay home with us kids all day long. You always were a woman of conviction who was willing to make tough choices when you believed that it was right. Thank you, Mom, for having fun with us and taking us on vacations and camping. Thank you for buying that old, used pop-up camper. We saw so much together on those road trips. Mom, you did not have the money to eat at restaurants on the way, so you packed sandwiches somehow and chips, and we picnicked at the road stops on the way. Lesser moms wouldn't have taken on that kind of challenge, but you went for it. And I have great memories of North Carolina and Tennessee and Colorado and Washington, D.C., all on a single mom's budget. Thank you, Mom, for the -the over-the-top birthday parties with so many Star Wars cakes and Spider-Man cakes and Superman cakes. Thanks for buying presents that you probably couldn't afford. Thank you for sending me to summer camp every single year, buying my first big wheels, my BMX bikes, my skateboards, Two sisters in the house who wanted to play with Barbies all day, and you got me that tiny black and white TV so that I could watch the Chicago Cubs in my bedroom, in my cave, listen to Harry Carey. You taught me to hold the door open for you so that I could understand that it was my responsibility to serve other people. Thank you for believing in me and cheering me on. You invested money and time in baseball and ice hockey and the high school debate team. I know it strained the finances when you bought all the equipment. and You sent me on all the out-of-town competitions, but you instinctively knew that I was gaining some of my first real confidence on those teams, a sense of who I was. And you would do anything that you could to fan those flames. Thank you for loving Linda and being so welcoming to her. Thank you, for, thank you for taking her in for the way that you supported our marriage. Thank you for raising us in a church and seeing to it that we learned the Bible so well. The churches that we went to, they had their share of issues, but they taught the Bible and they encouraged us to love Jesus. Even when I went through seasons of rebellion and not following Christ, I always knew that God was at least there because the seeds were planted in me. Thank you for supporting my calling to be a pastor. Mom, you had to give up more than most moms because I was often loving the church with a lot of my time and energy. When we moved to Oklahoma, you had to work through that with the Lord and you had to release us and do without us being close by. Thank you. I think you've done an amazing job as my mother. I hope you're lifted up this Mother's Day. We are your family. We are your legacy. And for generations, we'll be healthy and we'll grow and we'll stand on your spiritual shoulders. I love you. What can you do for her to honor her? Like maybe, I could say a couple of those sentences. How many could you say? Can you write it? 
can you speak it? What can you give? What's your mayo sandwich today? I don't get to say that every Sunday. Would you stand? I'm going to pray for all of us who are in need of healing. And I'm going to pray for a healing along the way as you follow the Lord. Lord Jesus, thank you, God, that your word, your wisdom is so high above our wisdom. And God, I pray that you would come in and I pray, Lord, that you would cause all of these ideas to connect to our exact situation. Don't let, don't let us wiggle out of this, Jesus. Give us something practical that we can walk in with our mom. I pray that this Mother's Day, it would be about growth and healing. Give us a fresh hope. We love you, Jesus, in Christ's name.